One of the most interesting paranormal cases of all, of all time is that of Annabelle the doll. A doll that allegedly is possessed by a demonic entity and attacked a few people. Now, this case occurred almost 30, 40 years ago, but it still raises many questions about how spirit possession of not just a person works, but also of an object. And can a spirit attachment, spirit or demonic, maintain a connection to an object or person even if the entity is long gone? I'm Jake Fife from Fife Paranormal. Today we're going to look into the case of Annabelle the Doll. In order to get a grasp of Annabelle the doll, we must first look at the history of Raggedy Ann. Raggedy Ann is a character created by American writer Johnny Gorilla that appeared in a series of books he wrote and illustrated for young children. Raggedy Ann is a rag doll with red yarn for hair and a triangle nose, and the character was created in 1915 as a doll and was introduced to the public in the 1918 book Raggedy Ann Stories. When a doll was marketed with the book, the concept had great success, and Raggedy Ann grew popular and became one of the most popular dolls on the market for children. In 1970, a mother purchased an antique Raggedy Ann doll from a hobby store. The doll had been a birthday present for her daughter, Donna, and Donna was preparing to graduate from college with a nursing degree. She lived in a tiny apartment with her roommate, Angie, and when she got the doll, Donna decided to place the doll on her bed as decoration, and she didn't give the doll another thought until things started happening. The doll mysteriously seemed to move about the house, relatively small movements at first, such as a change of position, but as time passed, the movements became more noticeable. Donna and Angie would come home to find the doll in a completely different room, and sometimes the doll would be found with legs crossed, arms folded, and other times it would be found upright, standing on its feet. Several times Donna sometimes left the doll on the couch before leaving for work, and when she would return she would find the doll back in her room on the bed with the door closed. Not only would the doll move, it could also write messages. About a month into their experiences, Donna and Angie began to find messages on parchment paper that read, Help Us and Help Lou. The handwriting as if it was written by a small child and one of the creepy parts about the messages was the fact that they were written on parchment paper which is something that none of them kept in the house. One day a male friend whose name was Lou was taking a nap and woke up with the doll staring at him and he felt as though he was being strangled. There were deep scratch wounds on his upper body and for a while he wouldn't go back in that room. The girls at first thought maybe an intruder was moving the doll around and leaving notes. When one night Donna came home to find the doll had moved again. This time it was on her bed. And that she found that it was very typical of the doll, but sometimes this felt different. Something wasn't right. A sense of fear came over her. When she inspected the doll, she saw what looked like blood drops on the back of its hands and its chest. Seemingly from nowhere, a liquidy red substance had appeared on the doll. Scared and desperate, Donna and Angie decided it was time to seek expert advice. Not knowing where to turn, they contacted a medium and a seance was held. Donna was then introduced to the spirit of Annabelle Higgins. The medium related the story of Annabelle to both Donna and Angie. Annabelle was a young girl that resided on the property before the apartments were built. They were happy times, as the spirit put it. She was a young girl of only seven years old when her lifeless body was found in the field upon which the apartment complex now stands. The spirit related to the medium that she felt comfortable with Donna and Angie and wanted to stay with them and be loved. Feeling compassion for Annabelle and her story, Donna gave her permission to inhabit the doll and stay with them. They were soon to find out, however, that the doll was not who she said she was. One of the most interesting parts of the case, and I talked a little bit about it earlier, was the experiences of Lou. Now, Lou was friends with Don and Angie, and he had been with them since the day the doll arrived. Lou had never liked the doll, and on several occasions he warned Donna that it was pure evil and to get rid of it. One night, Lou awoke from a deep sleep, and he was in a panic. Once again, he had a reoccurring bad dream, only this time, somehow, something seemed different. It was as though he was awake, but he couldn't move. He looked around the room, but couldn't discern anything out of the ordinary, and then he looked down towards his feet. And when he did, 
he saw the doll Annabelle. It began to slowly glide up his leg, moving over his chest, and then it stopped. Within seconds, the doll was strangling him. Paralyzed and gasping for breath, Lou blacked out. When he awoke the next day, he expected to find marks from the prior night's attack, but he found nothing. Preparing for a road trip the next day, Lou and Angie were reading over maps alone in her apartment. The apartment seemed eerily quiet, when suddenly rustling sounds coming from Donna's room aroused fear that someone had possibly broken into the apartment. Lou determined to figure out who or what it was, and he quietly made his way to the bedroom door. He waited for the noises to stop before entering and turning on the light. The room was empty except for Annabelle, which he tossed her in the floor in the corner. Lou scoured the room for forced entry, but nothing was out of place. Everything seemed normal. But as he got close to the doll, he felt that somebody was behind him. Spinning around, he was quick to realize nobody was there. Then, in a quick flash, he found himself grabbing for his chest, doubled over, cut, and bleeding. His shirt was stained with blood, and upon opening his shirt, there on his chest was what looked to be seven distinct claw marks, three vertically and four horizontally. The scratches healed almost immediately, and within a day, they were almost non-existent. Donna was finally willing to believe the spirit in her house was not that of a young girl, but an inhuman and demonic in nature. After Lou's experiences, Donna contacted an Episcopal priest named Father Hegan. Father Hegan felt that it was a spiritual matter and felt he needed to contact a higher authority in the church, and so he contacted Father Cook, who immediately contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. Ed Lorraine Warren immediately took interest in the case and contacted Donna concerning the doll. The Warrens, after speaking with Donna, Angie, and Lou, came to the immediate conclusion that the doll itself was not in fact possessed, but was being manipulated by an inhuman presence. That meant that the doll itself was not possessed, but that a supernatural force was making it appear as though the doll was alive. Truly, the spirit was not looking to stay attached to the doll, it was looking to possess a human host. When the girls contacted the medium, it gave them a false sad story of a little girl to win their sympathy, and when they gave it permission to stay and control the doll, the entity was free to do whatever it wanted. It aroused fear through the weird movements of the doll. It brought about the materialization of disturbing handwritten notes. The symbolic drops of blood on the doll, and ultimately it even attacked Lou, leaving behind the symbolic mark of the beast. At the conclusion of the investigation, the Warrens felt it was appropriate to have the father recite an exorcism blessing. At Donna's request, and as a further precaution against phenomena ever occurring in the home again, the Warrens took the big Raggedy Ann doll with them when they left. You would think this would be the end of the case, but it wasn't. Upon leaving, Ed placed the doll in the back seat and agreed he would not take the interstate in the event the inhuman spirit still resided within the doll. His suspicions were all too correct, and in no time the Warrens felt themselves as an object of a vicious hatred. Then at each dangerous curve, the car would swerve and stall with every corner, causing the power steering and brakes to fail. Repeatedly, the car verged on collision. Ed reached into the back seat, into his black bag, and took out a vial of holy water and doused the doll, making the sign of the cross over it. The disturbances stopped immediately, and the Warrens arrived safely home. After the Warrens arrived home, Ed sat the doll in a chair next to his desk. The doll levitated a number of times in the beginning, and then it seemed to fall inert. During the ensuing weeks, however, it began showing up in various rooms of the house. When the Warrens were away and had the doll locked up in the outer out office building, they would often return to find it sitting comfortably upstairs in Ed's easy chair when they opened the main front door. The doll also showed a hatred for clergymen who came to the home. In one instance, Father Jason Bradford, a Catholic exorcist, came to the house. Upon seeing the doll seated in the chair, he picked it up and said, You're just a rag doll, Annabelle. You can't hurt anyone, and tossed the doll back into the chair, at which Ed exclaimed, That's one thing you better not say. Upon leaving an hour later, Lorraine pleaded to the priest to please be careful while driving and to call her when he arrived home. Lorraine sensed tragedy for this young priest, but he had to go his way. A few hours later, Father Jason called Lorraine and explained that his brakes had failed as he entered a busy intersection. He was involved in a near-fatal car accident, destroying his vehicle. 
The Warrens had a special case built for Annabelle inside the Occult Museum, where she still resides to this day. Since the case was built, Annabelle no longer appeared to move, but she is thought to be responsible for the death of a young man who came to the museum on a motorcycle with his girlfriend. The young man, after hearing Ed's account of the doll, defiantly went up and began to bang on the case, insulting that if the doll can put scratches on people, then he wanted to also be scratched. Ed told the young man, son, you need to leave immediately and put him out of the building. On the way home, the young man and his girlfriend were laughing and making fun of the doll when he lost control of the motorcycle and went head on into a tree. The young man was killed instantly, but his girlfriend survived and was hospitalized for over a year. When asked what happened, the young woman explained that they were laughing about the doll when they had lost control of the motorcycle. So what is Annabelle the Doll the case? It is one of the strangest paranormal cases in history, especially since, to our knowledge, we don't have any video recordings of the meetings the Warrens had with Angie and Donna, and there aren't really any audio recordings that exist that we know of. Now, I'm sure in the Warrens files, they exist. They typically recorded all of their interviews. So at some point, I'm sure it will be released. But this is not the very first time that a doll or really any inanimate object has been allegedly possessed by whether an inhuman entity, demonic entity, or just a spirit in general. Look at cases such as Harold the doll, uh, Robert the doll, which is another doll that is said to have killed somebody. And boy, what's interesting about Annabelle is the fact that the doll itself was not possessed and is not possessed. An entity, an inhuman entity, was making it appear that the doll was possessed. So when you look at the state of the doll now, I know that it was on a Ghost Adventures episode uh, not terribly long ago and it still goes out for events, but I don't, in my personal opinion, I don't think the entity, whatever it was, was ever con was ever in the doll. I think that there was maybe uh, some energy that was attached to the doll. And I think that energy of the doll still resides to this day. Now, whether or not the doll is still capable of causing chaos, is capable of moving, in my personal opinion, I would say I think it is. I talked to some friends who were recently at an event with Annabelle the doll, and they told me that even after the doll had left, there was still a very charged energy in the spot where Annabelle was housed, and that during an investigation of the area that night, some spirits kept saying the name Annabelle over and over. So there is something still attached to the doll. Whether or not it's the same entity that's during the prayers, it might have been trapped inside the doll, or if it's purely intense and powerful residual energy that's just still able to manifest occasionally. We may never know the truth about the Annabelle doll case, but that doesn't keep us from searching for answers. I'm Jake Fife, and thank you all for joining me on another documentary of the paranormal.